Okay, my presentation, uh, well, first of all, this is me. I work at University of Padova. Uh, I teach, uh, I'm a professor there, I do research and teaching. And uh, basically, since I met uh, the open source community, I moved, uh, I decided to move uh, all my didactics towards open source. So I will be talking a bit about my experience. And uh, I will touch on three key points. Uh, I want to talk to you about my personal story, not because it's interesting, but uh, because I think it reflects a lot uh, of uh, what I hear from other people. So it's interesting to see how you come to use open source GIS and the spatial software and how that becomes like a domino effect on other people using it. So uh, I will talk about that. And then I will talk about how I use it in my job. So that's research and teaching, of course, with some examples. And lastly, just share some ideas with you and see if we get, can get some uh, question and answer session. Now, uh, for those of you that, uh, uh, that work with open source, probably you remember the first time you met, you understood what open source was. And uh, that, for me, goes back quite some time. And uh, if you are in uh, about my age, between your 40s and 50s, maybe this, these words uh, recall a song. And uh, for those of you who are younger or were not into that kind of music, of course, uh, uh, probably this has no meaning for you. But basically, it's like a, a love relationship because you suddenly realize that this type of software opens a lot of doors. But it was not easy. So what the phrases mean, wasted days and sleepless nights, because when I met the first time I understood, I met open source cross GIS, and I started saying, okay, easy, let's use it. But then I said, oh, to use it, you have to install Linux. What's, what is Linux? And then you say, okay, let's compile it. But that was not as easy as it sounds. So it, you know, the learning curve is very steep at those times. And, but when you s basically say that you're waiting for compilation to go correctly without any errors, when you're not an expert on uh, compiling source code, etc., cetera, it, uh, it was sleepless nights. You stayed awake and hope that uh, uh, Grass compiled because you really wanted to see it working on your computer with your Linux distribution. So I don't know if uh, you guessed the song, but this is basically a song by uh, Whitesnake, but depends if you're into that kind of music. Uh, so. How did it work out? Basically, I still remember I was in a conference like this, and I didn't know uh, much about uh, open, anything about open source. I knew a little bit about GIS. I used ArcView at that time. And my professor that I was doing my thesis with, we were walking together, and there was a stand with grass. And I asked him, what is this, you know, this software? And he said, it's a free software, and it's also open. You can use it to implement your own whatever you want. So my eyes started becoming bigger and said, you mean I can actually download it and use it for completely for free? And that's when it all started and I started becoming, you know, reading about it in blogs, in mailing lists, downloading the source code, compiling, etc. So that's when it all started. Secondly is the Grass user meeting in Trento, again, some time ago. And for me, those guys were like, you know, Superman because they really knew how to use the, the software. And, uh, but it was also a fun conference. The other conferences I go to sometimes are a bit more, you know, I don't want to say stuck up people, but uh, you know, it was much nicer to be in a more embracing community of people who really wanted things to work and were not just there to make publications or to go forward with their career. We had nice beers, you know, you know what I'm talking about because you're here. So that, that's, again, a push forward for me to, again, not only use it, look at Grass GIS, but on Kujis, which was just starting to be born, Quantum GIS. And then there's a turning point. The other turn, turning point was programming. So the fact that I was able at the beginning to compile, after sleepless nights, to compile Grass and make it work, 
got me really curious about how far I can push customization. So that brought me to programming, which then, of course, helped me very much in my research and is still doing so now. And uh, so that's why I put this, this, for those of you who like Matrix, that's why you choose to actually start and use the red pill because then you start learning how to program and then you spend a lot of time to implement your own code. And the first time I tried out, my very first publication was about implementation of the candy filter in grass, a very long time ago. And that's how I learned on CCIS. And then, of course, when I started teaching, I really had the, this feeling that because open source helped me so much in, to develop myself into learning how to program, then I said, I don't want my students to learn something which works well, but when they graduate, they have to, exactly what Maria was talking about this morning, they have to spend money, invest money, maybe they just graduated, they want to open a company or uh, be a freelance, and they're stuck with having to buy a software when there's very valid alternatives. That's why I started asking my, my department to install QGIS in the computers in uh, the university. And that's the face of the informatics guy when he met, meets me because you know, I asked him to actually install something which was quite different from, the, from what he was used to. And I really, I really insisted on that uh, because at that time open source was still not so easily installed and not everything went, uh, went smoothly. And that's why so I was not so well liked, well, not, not well liked, but uh, it was extra work for the department. And that's not always seen positively. So the end of the story is all this process of uh, using FOSS4G was an education process that now brought me to use uh, open source for 99% of my work. So I think that's quite a common story. It's not, you know, it's not, uh, it's not uh, something you never heard about. You probably hear it from most people who use FOSS4G. Uh, the only the thing that is interesting is that there's so many open doors. There's sometimes they they make you develop sometimes software. Like this is a software I was studying on laser scanning, and it looked really nice. So. I used a lot of my time to actually develop a graphical user interface that I never, you know, I never used again. And uh, so that's probably the only, not negative, but the only thing you have to be careful about, not to be sucked into the many possibilities of uh, what you can do with open source software. And um, so regarding the teaching, now, it's quite uh, normal, as you can imagine, that uh, instead of in GIS, using QGIS for teaching and other for higher education, like PhD courses and post-doctoral -doc courses, there is R, which you probably all know about. And I use a lot of cloud compare because I do a lot of research in laser scanning and point clouds. And uh, I will talk actually mostly about the summer school that uh, I co-organized with some colleagues from Austria and Germany, because again, most of the software there that is used is open source. And uh, the last one is just a very recent event that we had in Italy, which made me look into the quite popular as a snap to process uh, synthetic aperture radar imagery. So basically, the bottom line of this slide is there is really tools for anything you might need. And uh, there is no reason why not to use them. Courses in, uh, in the University of Padova, just go there quite quickly. Uh, remote sensing, there's a popular plugin by Luca Congedo, which is semi-automatic classification plugin. I use a lot of shared tutorials by this guy from India who made a really nice uh, uh, website with tutorials that I can share with students. And this made me understand that documentation that you find is very important because the more documentation, the more people you know, 
read read it and then learn how to use the software in a with this less steep learning curve but another thing that you can uh, you can actually see in this slide is that uh, a lot of success stories are single people if you see we, I just mentioned two but there's so many it's very hard to touch all of them but uh, a lot of things are done by single people who are very proactive in what they do and uh, that's quite important for uh, for the development of open open source software summer school is uh, basically what I want to share about this is a summer school that comes uh, every two years in a place called Obergurgo, which is not just a very nice mountain place, but has a lot of, uh, let's say, problems with hydrogeological risk. So debris flow, uh, falling rocks, a lot of erosion, and it's also by the tree line. So there's a lot of study going on there by University of Innsbruck about the uh, processes of uh, ecological and also geomorphological processes. But regarding open source, what's going on? The, the assignments, there's different assignments in the summer school, and the assignments that I was working on was basically grab a drone plus terrestrial imagery and through photogrammetry create a point cloud. Then the points, from the points we extract features that are then used for classification because we want to see each point as if it belongs to uh, bare ground or grass or snow. Now, each of these steps can see an open source software. The only thing that, uh, let's say, was a bit problematic for me at the beginning was that for photogrammetry, Photoscan is still the quick and dirty uh, software, which is not open source. So there is alternatives now, because again, a key aspect in education is that also the open source community has very fast paced uh, project. So there is now alternatives to Photoscan, which I did not use because I had to learn them myself how to use them before substituting it. But probably in the next edition of the summer school, we will substitute Photoscan and we will have a fully um, a full process with open source software. That this is just a result of the point cloud in uh, with also near-infrared information. I will not go into details, but you can talk to me if you want later for more, for more of those details. Then the next challenge was from the point clouds, we, can, we have information about color, we have infrared information, but we want also information about shape. So what I did, this is a, a way, it's a, the mathematical concept of extracting uh, features which describe shape. And there's a lot of these features that you can extract. The problem was that I did not have an open source software that extracted these indices. So, oops, spoiler. Uh, so actually I developed uh, the process in R for the students, but R is very slow. So to process about half a million points, it took almost a whole night because uh, I will not go into details, but these needs neighbors, so the half million points, each point had to look at the neighbors, uh, between 10 and 50 neighbors, so that took a very long time. But surprise, when I was in the summer school, I downloaded the new version of Cloud Compare, and I was just browsing to see how the change changes, and big surprise for me, I saw this voice said, compute geometric features, you know, and I was almost, a tear came in my eye because I saw that all of those features, most of these features were available and you can just process the point cloud from Cloud Compare. It took about 30 minutes. So I was very jumping out of my chair and telling the students to forget my R code because it would have taken way, way too long. And um, they used the Cloud Compare also for extracting these features, which then go to this random forest. It's a machine learning uh, classification and regression tree method that allows to use these features. And uh, let's see how much time I have. Basically what I gave the students was a hands-on tutorial using um, 
using uh, our studio, which we might also be able to see really quickly. It's just a few lines of code. This is our studio. It's in my computer back in the university. And uh, with about uh, 50 lines, I took the students through all the steps for applying the machine learning random forest algorithm to, to, the, to their points. And so I was teaching them uh, the final steps for classification. Now, this, the font is very small, so I will not, I will not, uh, I do not pretend that you will be reading it, but basically reading the points and this part trains the data. And after training, there's a prediction step. I cannot read it myself, but trust me, it's there. There's a prediction step. And after the prediction, you can just apply, you can export the classified points, and you can open in Cloud Compare the classified uh, point cloud and see how, you know, visually see the classified points. And last in line, of course, there is some steps for accuracy metrics, which you see down there. There's true positives, false positive rate, and there's kappa index, and there's many other, uh, there's confusion matrix for the classification output that you can extract to see how well your classification went. So open source software allowed me to give this type of uh, service, you could say, to the students participating to the summer school without putting a single penny in software. Just putting my own time in uh, preparing, of course, these tutorials. Now, I think my time is um, more or less okay, but uh, I can just uh, finish up. This was, in case, this was back up in case uh, the internet connection didn't work. So you just, this is what you saw before live. And final thoughts basically is, uh, it's, I think teaching is very important because it fosters uh, people to use open source uh, in, uh, JS, but also you sometimes find people who start to fall in love with what the possibilities are of using this software. So I always look, for example, for people who are, uh, who are so enthusiastic about what they learn about open source uh, that they can do their thesis with me or they start doing a PhD because those are like, you know, gold, uh, it's like a gold mine because then those people the enthusiasm grows, and then they become themselves contributors to FOSS. So that's very important. And I, I saw, in, I touched with my own hands, the importance of shared tutorials and data sets, because then makes things easier for people to teach. You know, being lazy, you know, you don't want to reinvent the wheel, so if there's already good tutorials out there, that helps a lot. Uh, and I end up with saying a big thank you to people who are much more proactive than me into promoting time and energy. I was in Geospatial Week some, uh, in Enschede in Holland some weeks ago, and again, there was people doing tutorials in OpenStreetMap. You know them probably, Maria and the other ladies. So I think we have to thank them also for pushing uh, knowledge forward. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Question time. Plus five minutes for answers, so. Sure. I'm curious to know if you experience any pushback from your colleagues in converting all of your course material over to FOSS. Uh, at the beginning, uh, that's a good question because at the beginning, the arc view, now it was, it was arc view, was very much rooted in the system. And in the University of Padua, we also have a campus license. So actually, of course, uh, the university pays very little for the whole license for every, so they're doing a lot of marketing on, which is a normal, they're a company. And uh, when I started using QGIS, the main, let's say, obstacle was of course from the informatics guys, because they had to do extra work. A little bit also from, uh, uh, the people that, uh, like, after students graduate, we have a lot of connections with companies to s because we get feedback 
if you know what we teach the students helps the companies or not. Now, ArcGIS was very much used in companies, so they said that they would have preferred students to know ArcGIS, but our answer was that we do not teach where the buttons are, we just teach the what's behind GIS, so we and we do not want to be uh, how do you say lobbied into using one or another software and but no we did not have absolutely any type of other pressure one more question hi uh, my name is uh, Jonna Bos I'm from Nieuwland Geo Informatie uh, from the Netherlands and I teach but it's not a university uh, so uh, we really like to have all our courses only in QGIS and stuff, but we have, uh, yeah, our students are not from university, it's just people who work somewhere and want to buy a course and uh, how to reach people from companies and from municipals and things with your open source courses instead of your ArcGIS courses, which they know. Yeah. I understand the question very well, because uh, it's, it's if you have a company and you have uh, bought ArcGIS, you obviously want a course on ArcGIS. So the thing is, uh, uh, education starts from university, because the people who graduate, they will be used to QGIS. And now in Italy, I see a lot of uh, public administration, they are just changing. It took a while, but now it's a downhill process. But before it was very, there was a big obstacle because it's very, very costly to public administration and also companies to, you know, get rid of a software, do, how do you say, again, teach again all the people who use that type of software. And it's also a risk because they don't know, like us, how well QGIS works. So they can just take our word for it. But uh, I think that uh, it was, a problem some time ago and now it should get better because the more people use open ac open source you know the more other people want to use it because they say it works so it's uh, but i understand that professionals of course you know it's hard